So today, uh, my presentation is going to be on portal hypertension and CARTO. What is CARTO? We will we'll go into that and give you more sort of definition and the background information. So I'm going to start with the intro case. So this is something that one of our colleagues, you know, they usually see when they do endoscopic sort of a um, screening once a patient come in for the uh, upper GI bleeds. So what do we do, right? So here's a case, 75 year old gentleman presented with alcoholic sources, MELDOM-19, acute GI bleed with multiple transfusions from outside hospital. Transferred to us, again, requiring more transfusions, intubated two pressors and they scoped, they did upper GI and it showed gastric varices. So what you see on CT, as you know. So what do we do for these patients, right? Next case, 64-year-old gentleman, Hep C alcoholic cirrhosis, but high MELD, MELD over 28, with again, massive uh, hemochromesis, transfer from outside hospital, again, multiple transfer, uh, transfusions, endoscopy showing large varices with, again, three pressors, massive transfusion protocol requiring iron interventions. So what do we do for these patients, right? Again, the difference is this patient has very large shunt, which is different from the first patients. Again, this is the venography showing again, the shunt being a lot bigger than uh, 20 centimeters, 20 millimeters. So what can you do for these patients? So today I'm going to, again, start with the intro case, as you saw. Uh, I'll go into CARTO, BRTO, uh, briefly on BRTO, but mostly CARTO. And hopefully I can tell you everything that you need to know about CARTO. And we'll go into why Azura coils for CARTO that I chose. And I'll give you a CARTO case and end of the summary. So first, BRTO. What is BRTO? It's not burrito. As some people, and actually my hepatologist, one of the elderly hepatologists in our institution, will still write in, in our medical record, please call Dr. Lee and order BRTO but burrito. This is not what we're looking for. Burrito is not BRTO. BRTO stands for balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. So basically, you have a gastric vein with the portal hypotension, the flow which should go this way, but now we're going backwards and create this very and stomach wall. And usually they'll drain through another circulation through the draining vessels. But when there's a pressure that's getting built up, it's this gastric versus that will be rupturing into the stomach. So when we do BRTO, what we do is we balloon occlude, we go retrograde backwards through the venous, transvenous, and we obliterate the varices. That's what BRTO stands for. Another cartoon that I put it together again, liver disease, portal vein comes from SMB and splenic vein. The flow should be right there going towards the portal vein to the liver. We do again, severe portal hypertension. Now flows are redirected to left gastric vein, posterior gastric vein, short gastric vein into gastric varices. And they usually drain again through the gastrointestinal shunt to the systemic circulation. And when the pressure again can build up, you have a gastric peristal bleeding. So we perform BRTO or CARTO, we occlude the draining vessel. And we again retrograde through the venous using the ACE sclerosing agent or gel foam. We obliterate gastric varices and you stop bleeding. Give you a little more background information on cirrhosis, poor hypertension, and BRTO. Liver disease, again, 20,000 deaths per year in the U.S. It's been half over the past four years, but it's still continuously increasing. There's 14,000 deaths per year uh, from HCC, which actually doubled over the last 20 years with the better diagnostic tools. Liver transplant is the gold standard. Uh, there's a 12,000 patients on wait listed on uh, this year's OPTN data. It has great survival, 75% in five years, and there's increasing liver donor tra transplant uh, as of last year, about 100% increase over the past five years. There's about 5,000 TIPS per year that's performing. Why is that TIPS important? You know, I'm not gonna go over in detail today, but TIPS is another treatment option for gastric paresis, as you know. BRTO, CARTO, and also there's a PARTO. We don't know how many actually are being performed in the US, but their increasing number are being performed. Again, this is what it looks like. 10% of upper GI bleed or GI bleed in general is related to varices, which is you know, count to about 40,000 cases per year. Varices are presented up to about 75% of cirrhotic patients, and one third of them will actually, you know, eventually a rupture at some point. Mortality can be as high as 50% after the first bleed, and the rebleeding risk is highest during the first few days after the first bleed. 
luckily, as far as the gastric burst is concerned, we have some anatomical advantage. Uh, again, gastric burst is about 30% of the um, um, uh, of the portal hypertension, and it has a distinct anatomical sort of landmarks that we use for treat these patients. We have afferent or feeding vessel, left gastric, uh, short gastric, and the posterior gastric vein, which are all considered as a feeding vessel. It has an efferent vessel, which is a draining vessel, um, which, you know, either a renal shunt, gastrointestinal shunt, gastrocable shunt, which are the efferent draining vessels. Mortality can be as a highest greater than 45%, but luckily about 80% of this patient with the gastric paresis will have a shunt. That means we should be able to perform something like some kind of RTO or BRTO partial. Usually these are cardiac and fundal location of the stomach. It's a very difficult for endoscopist, and sometimes the bending lesion can be very challenging. And also someone with a severe encephalopathy and patient with a decompensated uh, liver disease, this is not a good option. So again, the BRT become very attractive. So variceal bleeding, again, there's a med medical management, there's sclerotherapy, banding, acutai, beta blocker, or supportive care at some centers. There's surgical management as a shunt surgery, soft transaction surgery procedure. But again, the gold standard is the best is a liver transplant. From us, interventional management, we can do tips or BRT for these patients. Their outcomes, some of them are great, but not that great. Endoscopic treatments is limited. There's even some risky because also embolization, some perps have been reported. And unfortunately, re bleeding rate is high as a 50 to 90%. Tips, one of our, you know, the procedures that we, we're, we're very happy to do. Again, re bleeding rate is up to about 23% in gastric burnsies. And, you know, we have some patency issues which have improved, but biggest problem is patient with hepatic encephalopathy or someone with a hepatic insufficiency, TIPS is not the best option. Surgery is only, again, patient with a reasonable liver function, and again, it, it has its own mortality rate. So it's not for everyone. Whereas the BRTO has been shown to have a very high efficacy, I'll show some of the data later, re bleeding rate less than 10% in all literatures, less invasive as we know, and patient with a poor hepatic function and hepatic encephalopathy can undergo BRTO to be treated for their gastric viruses. So why in BRTO has an initial decline? Uh, when you first came out about uh, 30 years ago, it was unclear outcome. There's no data, obviously, you know, because we were very data-driven. You know, um, we were very unfamiliar with the sclerosing agent at the time, because again, they were very new and we weren't doing much of a procedure with the sclerosing agent. And also at the same time, it's a very similar time, actually, the TIPS was developed, invented in 1969 and had a robust development. So BRTO was kind of a shadow and shadow away from in the US. <clears throat> Currently, there's increasing interest in the BRTO, oops, US. Again, why? Because we started seeing some poor outcomes with the TIPS, especially in patients with a high MEL score, and also patients with hepatic encephalopathy after TIPS is concerning, and a lot of our referring doctors are concerned. And, you know, we started noticing with the BRTO or RTO, there's transient improvement of liver function. Again, the more data needs to be come up, but that's very promising and attractive. So when do we perform BRTO or CARTO indications? So ASLD, Governing Body for Liver Disease, and also SIR, our society, there's no guideline as of today. They're working on it as we speak right now, and there's other couple of uh, the groups that are trying to put together guideline and recommendation for BRTO and gastric burial bleeding. So in our institution, we use basically our own anecdotal and publication, published data, and which two indications, gastric burial bleeding, and hepatic encephalopathy as indication for the BRTO and CARTO. So how to do BRTO in brief? Again, I'm not gonna go in detail again because it's not for BRTO. We'll talk about this later in other maybe uh, forum, but to, to quick in, in brief, basically you have a balloon that occludes the draining vein. You overestimate it and there's different type of balloon you can use. And you inject and contrast to see how it looks and how much volume you require. Based on that volume, you inject sclerosin agent 5% ethylene oleate in, in Asia, and we use 3% sotrodecal mostly in America. <clears throat> You'll inject that slowly over the, through the balloon that's occluding. Here's a balloon occlusion, and you're injecting sclerotherapy all the way as much as you can until you see them into the gastric sort of varices. And once you see them, you have the balloon that's indwelling, again, in, indwelling balloon in the draining vessel for anywhere from two hours 
up to 36 hours were reported with a median of six hours in the gastro gastrointestinal shunt until there's a sclerotherapy, you know, sclerosis and hardens the vessel. And once you see this is completely hardened, that's when you remove the balloon and you complete the, the BRTO. Now, patient came to your angio suite, gone through the initial BRTO, mostly at the, into some place like our, you know, our institutions. We, because there's an indwelling balloon, this patient has to go to high level care, ICU, CCU, sometimes the ER, to get that monitor for how many hours until they come back. And then now you have to do second IR procedures. So why doing BRTO or RTOs? At our group, we performed the meta-analysis several years ago, looking at over 1,000 patients that underwent BRTO with a different type of literature in English. And we saw 96% technical success and 97% clinical success with only 2.7% cumulative rebuilding rate. Again, 2.7% rebuilding rate, which is less than anything that we've seen in other treatment modality. Again, here is the, one of the, the studies that we include, which was a 10-year prospective follow-up data from Japan. They have a 3% rebuilding rate in over 10 years of oh, so 60 patients, 68 patients. So compared to endoscopy to BRTO, 48% rebuilding rate for endoscopy, and BRTO only 2%. Again, this was a prospective study. Another prospective study comparing the TIPS versus BRTO. TIPS had 25%, whereas the BRTO had 2% of a rebuilding rate. Again, markedly important, you know, improved and better than the other treatment options that I have shown to you before. But other clinical outcomes that we have with the BRTO for the gastric reversal bleeding, again, because you may be blocking the only shunt that's in the portal system, you may increase the portal blood flow, hence increasing portal pressure, but again, they normalize within about four weeks. It also is shown to improve LFT's liver functions, and it definitely improved, and we actually shown in our group, that it improved and it actually treats hepatic encephalopathy for some of these patients. How about complications? Any procedure we perform has complications. Again, from our meta-analysis, we look at, again, 1,000 patients. And the major complication rate was a very low, only 2.6%. Most common complication was a recurrent esophageal versal bleeding. But again, esophageal versal bleeding is easily treated by endoscopy, you know, colleagues or if you get any tips to treat this, so it's not, you know, that much of a problem. Sometimes you'll have ascites again, because this was only portal systemic shunt that was you know, being created by the body, and now we block them, so you may actually have a complication of poor hypertension, but again, it's less than 10%. The important thing is the major complication rate is only 2.6%. But these are some of the complications that's you know, specifically associated with the BRTO. Gross hematuria, pulmonary embolism, that are permanent, anaphylactic shock, rapid hepatic and renal failure, portal vein and renal vein thrombosis. Why all these are things happening? Because you're using indwelling balloon and also using sclerosing agent. So these two things become, you know, sort of vein of existence for us to want to do BRTO because again, these are making things complicated again. Not very high rate, but you don't want any of your patients to go through this complication. So this was becoming a concern, especially in um, Western culture. So what we come up, actually before CARTO, I have to mention PARTO. Dr. Kwan at Asa Medical Center in Korea, he invented it and called the term, what's called the PARTO, plug assisted retrograde transvenous obliteration. What does that mean? So instead of a blood, uh, the, the balloon, we're using a plug to block the draining vessel. Instead of a sclerosin agent, we're using gel foam to obliterate the, the shunt and the varices. So there's no plug, I mean, if there's no balloon, and there's no sclerosin agent. So technically now it became safer with the less complication that's associated with those balloon and the sclerosin agent. So there's no migration of a sclerosin agent. There's no permanent permanent embolism. There's no fear of a hematria or renal failure from the sclerosin agent. So theoretically, there's a faster procedure time. And, and this, when you use the gel foam, what another important thing is, which I kind of skipped through the procedure is, when you do BRTO, you actually have to coil embolize all these sort of a branching sort of a draining collaterals. Why? Because otherwise the sclerosin agent is going to leak out of that and go somewhere else and cause again complications, right? But with the gel foam, gel foam itself auto embolize those sort of small drain, the, the collaterals. So you don't have to embolize in the coil. So overall, probably a faster procedure time. And it hasn't been tested and validated, but 
may be most likely cost effective. So what's Carto then? Well, you know, Carto sounds great, and I know I love Carto as well too. But Carto became inevitable. Why? Because what I call a new and improved BRTO, coil assisted. Again, instead of a balloon or a plug, now I'm using a coil to blocking the draining vessel, and I still use a gel foam to obliterate the shunt and the varices. So again, no embolization of uh, coil. We were using embolization with the coil and gel foam, so there's no indwelling balloon. There's no sclerosing agent. And this becomes important because a plug, there's a limited size of plug, where also to place a plug, you have to have shunt, the, the sheet that go, go all the way to the shunt, which is a very tough angle, sometimes inaccessible. But with the coil embolization, it's easy to access those area, and it's easy to place coil to perform carto, which become, I think, more favorable and improved. So again, safer, is less complications. No migration of a sclerosin agent. Again, no pulmonary embolism or no hematria or renal failure associated with the BRTO. And again, overall, this again hasn't been proven, but I think it's more cost effective. Because there's no ICU beds, there's no second IR procedure, and overall faster procedure time, given all those, I think it's more cost effective. Again, this is to be studied and validated. Here's our first study that was published in 2014, looking at the preliminary data of our 20 patient undergoing CARTO for variceal bleeding, 0% rebleeding rate following up for about five years. Second, it was published a couple of years ago, again, CARTO for treating hepatic encephalopathy, 43 patients, it's an overall survival of about 78% over, you know, through over seven years. And I think, again, hepatic encephalopathy improved in 91% of these patients. This is amazing because there's no, as you know, there's no treatment option for hepatic encephalopathy, especially the refractory. And your hepatology colleagues have no way to treat these patients. Now they think and they believe there's a treatment option for this and we're promoting this and a lot of hepatologists are also supporting this. So how to do CAR-2 procedure? First, pre car evaluation, you know, you have to have liver function, make sure your liver can handle it and there's no issue and they're not decompensating. Renal function, not as important as BRTO because there's no renal toxicity with the gel foam, but we still need to look into it. Three-phase liver CT is absolutely important because you need to know there's gastric varices and how it looks, gastroesophageal varices, and again, how it looks and what size they are. And again, you have to look at the shunt because that's where you're gonna block with the coil so you can sort of uh, uh, pre-plan your carto. Shunt diameter on hands is important. Ascites, hydrothorax, splenomegaly, those are all very, very important because again, you need to assess pre-treatment so you can you know, see how bad it gets you know, and you know how you can deal with them. If you have splenic vein thrombosis, this is a completely different disease. Now you have a sensual poor hypotension, not true sort of a poor hypotension. So it's treatment is very different. Again, it's not a scope of this presentation. So we'll discuss this in later. Again, here's the gastric varices and here's the shunt. First, you have an IVC through the femoral. This is a femoral approach, transfemoral approach. You have a sheet all the way close to the IVC, or sometimes you can put it into the renal vein. And now you have a one catheter through the sheet going all the way distally. So it's one catheter distal. Again, sheet and second sheet potentially to stabilize it. And now you're doing a venogram to measure the shunt diameter. Sometimes you do venography with the balloon to perform if you like to. And in the beginning, I think it's useful to do it just to understand the anatomy, you know, so anatomy and how the flow dynamics are. And now you have a second catheter, which is placed approximately. Again, distally placed catheter, approximately placed catheter. Now you embolize the coil to completely occlude the draining vessel. And then through that, now you're injecting gel foam through the distally placed catheter, again, here's the gel foam, they usually settle down into the coil and they'll go up this way and fill the entire shunt and go through the little, the transmittal the, the, the junction into the varices. And now here's the varices in the lumen. It's important, it's critical that you embolize entire varices as well as the, the, the feeding vessel. Now, once you start seeing the feeding vessel, here's the varices again, and here's the feeding vessel. This is when you stop. And again, so now you have a coil occlusion, retrograde venous obliteration of the varices. 
And we've done a first few, several studies doing a cone beam CT to confirm that we really got all the varices. So again, here's a coil shunt varices with a cone beam CT with the reconstruction. You can see these little tiny collaterals that are being embolized with gel foam, you know, very easily again. Otherwise, on BRTO, these needs to be coil embolized individually so you don't have any leakage of the sporcing agent. Again, this is a cone beam CT of a pre-CT, cone beam CT images cor correlating, and this is a post-complete obliteration of viruses. So post cartel follow-up, again, one or, two, one or two days of a message or up floor, you do triple phase CT to make sure there's no complications, status of viruses to make sure they're all gone. And then you do routine hepatology GI follow-up every three to six months. Here's a CT pre-gastric viruses and shunt, three days after completely dis you know, obliterated and disappear. One month, six month, complete ablation, obliteration of the gastric viruses and this patient never bled again. And here's the, your friend endoscopist view again, gastric viruses and fundus. I mean, these are just about to rupture and they will be massive, fatal bleed. Six months after CARTO, it's completely obliterated and gone. I mean, your endoscopic and, and hepatology you know, fellow with the friends will love you because it's just shocking how it's all completely gone. So why am I using Azure for CARTO? So, you know, give you a couple of pictures. Here's what microscopic and the electromicroscopic appearance of uh, the hydrogel, which is the base te technology for the, the Azure coils. We have this pore that's a space that, you know, provides a more surface area and also scaffolding for tissue ingrowth. Why is that important? So if you do embolizations, again, here's the arterial lumen, it's endothelial cells, and now you have these hydrogel. The sewer muscle cells will grow into the hydrogel to become sort of a, in, you know, so integrate into the hydrogel, becomes sort of a solid mechanical blockage, which is very different from some of the other, for instance, bare metal coil. All you see is here's bare metal coil, coil. You see thrombogenesis, or actually the clots that are forming around the area, there's no ingrowth of these muscle cells like the hydrogel coils do. Why is that important? Because I think if these mechanical embolization is absolutely important, Again, why? I'm gonna show you one very sort of exciting image, which is this. You're seeing there's a coil and ingrowth of this tissue into the area of embolization. So again, now you have complete tissue blockage of the vessel. Whereas if you have thrombosis, what's gonna happen along the line is you get recannulate and those will be, again, there'll be flow through it and patient may bleed again. Whereas this mechanical embolization, you will not have the the recanalizations and the bleeding. Another important factor, I know some people don't believe it, and I wasn't a believer of angiocalc, but when I tested, it actually was a true to what the calculation they do. Angiocalc is basically based on the volumetrics. They give you what kind of a packing you can do with a coil embolization. There's different things you do, obviously. I'm not interested in annuals in packing. I was interested in vessel like my shunt and how many coils do I need to block off the shunt you know, to perform the CARTO effectively. And I've used the several different coil models. So there's at least comparison of the volume efficiency. So to achieve 25% occlusion density using angiocal, there's different type of coil. I would need 25 concerto uh, PGLA. I would need a 13 ruby, but whereas I need only three hydrogel coils, 435, and six CX035 coils, and five hydrogel coils again the number of coils are significantly lower compared to other market coils. Why is that important? Again, in our COVID world right now, everything's cost related and you have to be efficient and cost effective. As you can see, to again, block that 11 centimeter coil, the 11 centimeter vessel, all I need to spend using the hydrogel coil is anywhere from 3,300 to $3,900, right? Whereas comparison to other coils, I only need to spend 16,000 dollars to do the same job. I think, you know, this is pretty obvious. And why is that important? If you have, what would you do for your patient? You have a $16,000 with this thrombosis that could be cannulate, or you want $4,000 work with a complete mechanical occlusion. I think that's answer right there. And I think this is pretty dramatic difference. Just give you one quick Azure Carto case. So here's the Azure Carto case. 40-year-old gentleman with the NASH cirrhosis, hepatic encephalopathy, elevated ammonia level at 350, was having a score of four when they presented. Six hospitalizations in the last two months because of hepatic encephalopathy. You know, they're asking, can you help? 
and here's a bunch of photosystemic shunt that's causing hepatic encephalopathy. So we, and from the, this time with the, the jugular approach, we go into the shunt, you see how extensive and big shunt it is on the right, and it's one on the left. Approach, again, we use the jugular, a catheter, any full French catheter will you, you know, be appropriate for this. Again, this is off-label, so, but there's different catheters that I use, but I love full French Navicons. Again, you coil embolize them. Now, sometimes you don't even have to use a gel foam if you can completely siege the, the flow with a coil. Here's the left side. So you put several coils into the both sides and use a hydrogel of four, three, five coils. Again, time-wise, using probably you know, six to seven coils compared to 20, 30, or one eight coils. So you're you know, significantly decreasing the, the, the time of embolization as well too. Ammonia level went to 52 from 300s. No hepatic encephalopathy symptom in one year and no additional hospitalization again. This is what's very important for yourself but also for your referring doctors. Again, this is the, the paper we published in 2018. We had a follow up to 1800 days. Clinical success of 91% improvement of hepatic encephalopathy following part two for the, these patients. And median improvement was a waste heaven from three to one. And median ammonia improvement was 130s to 70 with over survival of over 1400 days. One last case. Here's a similar patient with Nash cirrhosis, massive bleeding, multiple transfusions, of which are showing normal except the gastric varices and gastrointestinal shunt. So we brought up the endoscope of sweet. 10 French sheath was placed, full French glide catheter all the way distally, as I mentioned. And you see. You know, first, initially, because of hemodynamic appearance, you will never see varices. Varices here somewhere, but because of flows coming into the shunt, you'll never see that varices. But you sort of see the size of the shunt, locations, and so forth. We measure the one of the, the smallest diameter. Again, second glide, second four French glide catheter going in. So now we have one distal placement, one proximal placement, and you when using the first proximal placement. I'm going to use an 035 coil embolize a shunt. And you can appreciate the distal catheter, but it's embedded here somewhere. I'll be injecting gel foam through that. Here's the gel foam coming in. Now you start seeing something that we weren't seeing before, which is the gastric varices. Again, sheet, two full French glide catheter, one distal, one proximal coil embolization of a shunt, injecting gel foam that goes all the way into the shunt, and it's gonna spill into the varices. And here's what it looks like. This is all varices, and now you see actually feeding vessel from the portal system. Now you start seeing it, that's when you stop. So require nine packs of gel foam. Again, taking care of all the gastric renal shunt, gastric varices, and the distal part of the feeding vessel. Again, it's the same image, but again, it's very impressive change that you see from pre carto to post carto. Again, this was a published back in 2014, only 20 patients, but 100% technical and clinical success rate with follow up of 384 days with a zero rebleeding rate. So, this is normally how we'll follow in our uh, institution in terms of algorithm. Gastric variable bleeding comes in, you know, we have to see whether it's emergent or elective. If it's emergent, you need to see how the patient's doing. Is it low, low male? This patient has gastric varices or gastric and esophageal varices. If you have a low male with both variceal bleeding, you should probably do tips for these patients, right? But if you have only gastric variceal bleeding, depends on your comfort level, you can do tips or you can do carto either way. This is in case of emergent gastric variceal bleeding. In elective case, you should probably do all CARTO again, why? Right? Because you preserve the, you know, the, the liver function and you can always do tips later. High male score and someone with hepatic encephalopathy, you should definitely do CARTO to treat these patients before you would consider doing tips. So in summary, BRTO, CARTO, PARTO, again, it's a great treatment option for gastric variceal bleeding and hepatic encephalopathy. Who needs the RTOs? You need to know the patient's indications, patient's male score, the hepatic encephalopathy, 
all the clinical information. Why RTOs? It's effective for gastric pressure bleeding and hepatic encephalopathy. It also improves the survival, and I think it will also improve the quality of life. Cartopardo part especially is more efficient, I think. And again, you have to must understand them how to do it before you do it, because there's always also complications associated with it. And finally, Azure coil, I think, is an excellent embolic material. It's effective, it's a safe, it's cost-efficient, and time-efficient as well, too. Thank you.